And even before posting it, I just know that's going to do well. To actually get views, you found a way to like take that niche down thing and maybe make it broader. So yeah. a lot of people are interested in it. So, okay, here, I'll give you a perfect example uh -huh. of, of how to do that. What's up? Welcome back to the show. Today, I have Ashwin Krishna Swami, Krishna Swami, also known as Schwinnabego on Instagram uh, and other social apps. Content creator who I think is very interesting. He's built a pretty big following making very niche content with a really high quality audience that really probably feeds his business a lot. And we'll get into that. So we're going to get into his backstory. We're going to get into sort of the tactics, how he got into content and how, how he's gotten to grow his social accounts so much. Ashton, welcome to the show, my guy. Love it. Thank you for having me. So uh, let's, do the, let's do the childhood thing. Let's start a childhood. Um, but like, tell me about, tell me about growing up. Like what, you know, were you always like an entrepreneurial kid or what were you into growing up? I was hard to wrangle in school. Uh -huh. Um, I found it hard to just pay attention. I didn't like care much for like, my sister was kind of very by the books. Yeah. Um, but I didn't like take to studying and like doing super well in classes uh -huh. more like very social and like just had that kind of like creative kind of entrepreneurial spirit. You're like, neuro, like, are you like ADD or some kind of, neuro, I don't know, what are the kids saying now, neurodivergent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I don't know about that. I think it's just like when you have children in a eight to three schooling system when yeah. they're 10 years old and you're like, learn math and learn English. It's good, like a yeah. pretty tough who, thing to who do. Who thrives in that? Who thrives in that? <laughs> you know? Who thrives in that? You have to, have to conform to being obedient. I was just like, I'm not listening to this. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're like, you're more social. Were you, uh, there's a few breadcrumbs I usually see. Like a lot of times entrepreneurial people, they were like either like very into a sport or like some kind of thing that they put all their time into, or they were like, they were like the shoe flipper. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There was always, um, I was always like very engaged and interested in like how people build things. Like there was mm -hmm. even before like Shark Tank, when I was growing up, there was this, there was a show, um, American Inventor or American Innovator. It was like kind of a niche show, yeah, yeah. but I loved watching that. Mm -hmm. I just absolutely loved that. And then like Shark Tank started and then like the profit started. And I just like watch all of these shows and mm -hmm. I just like love. I love like businesses and I love small businesses and I love kind of looking at every aspect of them. And then in high school, yeah, there's like the classic like drop shipping was like buying Lacoste t-shirts with like nice. my, my friends. I was like yeah. the hot thing. Right. Um, and, uh, yeah, there were just like a variety of various, like non profitable, like yeah. jinx things just that we did. Just trying some stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. yeah, you yeah. Just try to just try to hustle make a and trying to make some money. Yeah. What, like what was your like finance, your kind of parents financial situation? Like, like were you guys, pretty pretty good or was it like i'm trying to make money to buy my own stuff or yeah it was um i think my parents did a really good job kind of grounding myself and my sister and like my dad kind of like did well in his career but uh -huh. kind of lived a very middle class life and like mm -hmm. was like hey if you guys want to go buy that like if you want to buy a car do whatever like go get a job and, and uh -huh. make make money so yeah when i was the second that i could get a job it was probably like 15 i did and then i worked all through high school mm -hmm. um just because i liked having that independence you know not saying like hey can you give so me 20 yeah, bucks basically it's like the relationship with money represented sort of independence to you a hundred percent and i'm like well if i work i can make this money and then i don't need to justify or explain why i want to buy that xbox or buy that xbox right. game yeah it's like i want jordans i know they're not practical yeah uh i don't have to explain that to my dad yeah yeah i'm yeah. just gonna buy them exactly yeah, I exactly got i got you so fast forward you went said you went to nyu so I went to even, nyu even though you didn't thrive in the school system even though i didn't you know it was uh the middle of sophomore year that i oh. picked it up i there was i went to a public school outside of philly there were 400 kids in the class and the middle of sophomore year, my rank out of 400 was like 290. Uh -huh. And my sister went to Northwestern, great school, like, yeah. you know, did, did super well. And I was like, oh, shit, like, I want to go to a good college, you know, like, uh -huh. I'm, I'm smart. I want to do things. It's kind of just... a it's kind of like a like an East Coast culture thing, I feel like is like go to a good school, like get a good, I don't know, maybe, maybe it is everywhere, but like maybe more so. Yeah, I think East Coast. And then also like I'm, you know, first generation here okay. and like. Indian parents and like all my cousins went to really good yeah. schools and it's was like, there pressure there? Th there's a real focus on education for uh -huh. sure. And so yeah. it was kind of without a doubt. My parents were like, you, you will go to a good school. Uh -huh. So you got to like get and then serious you'll become about a doctor. It. You got, yeah, you know, it was like <laughs> doctor engineer. Um, 
they, they kind of like let let that go with me a little bit. Um, That's nice. Yeah. That's good. But uh, yeah, probably midway through my sophomore year, I was like, oh, I should start buckling down and start studying. And uh-huh. so then then really like kind of kicked it into high gear for Got a, a year out. and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, after college, you went right into the startup world, though. And this is curious to me. Did you feel like you had like a like, was there a low point here? Like, I just don't see a lot of people like getting right into startups without having like some kind of like sort of low point where they're like, oh man, I just like hate work. They go to an internship. They hate working there. It like sucking their soul, something like that. It just, it's uncommon because you went right into startups out of yeah. college, right? Yeah. I went to NYU's undergrad business school and I majored in finance and going in, I thought, oh, I'm going to go into like banking and yeah. private equity. It's like my sister, Classic. you know, five years older, she yeah. went into banking. So I was like, okay, I'll do that. But I have 18 years old. I have no idea what banking is, right? Yeah. I have the no idea how we, to financial. The fact that we say to 18 or 20 year olds, like, hey, what do you want to do for the rest of your Preposterous. life? Preposterous. Like, yeah. No, Preposterous I totally idea. know that, you know? Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so I I had an internship my freshman my freshman into sophomore year working at a hedge fund. And it was like a small hedge fund. There's probably uh-huh. like 15 people there. And um, I went in every day. So it was like two semesters in a summer. I went in every day and I was just like, how do people do this? This yeah. is like not really that interesting at all. And it's like, sure, they're like well paid, but like everyone there was <laughs> super boring and yeah. super dry. And I'm like, the, there's no life at all in the office. I'm like, damn, you guys just like come in here and log on to these terminals for like, 12 hours uh-huh. a day and then go home. And I'm like, this is not for me. This is, this is not doing it, it at all. Sucks your soul. Yeah. So, um, so after that, I was like, I don't really want to do that. And then, um, so, so my sophomore year, thankfully at NYU, there's like a, there's a pretty growing kind of like entrepreneurial community. Uh-huh. This was one like, and New York City was being dubbed like Silicon Alley. There was like a lot of, yeah, there was yeah. like the rise of There's Foursquare. a lot of Silicon different things. There's you got Silicon Slopes. Yeah, yeah, you yeah, t- you exactly. Got, you got like the Silicon Mountains somewhere. And the, yeah, was, yeah, everybody wants to be Silicon. Yeah. So, so there were, um, there was like Techstars New York. So I did an internship at a couple of companies there. I did uh-huh. an internship at now a, you know, cl- close friend um, at his startup. Uh, and then I had those experience and I was like, oh, this is so much better. I'm kind of like, it's more exciting. It's, it's far more, it's more exciting, volatile. you know, it's, it's more volatile, but there was this opportunity of like, I would work on kind of some various like marketing ideas or kind of like strategy ideas. And there was just kind of like open-ended, like, Hey, run with it, you know, uh-huh. like build a brief, build the idea and then go execute on it. And I really thrived and with that kind of independence, I was like, oh, this is cool. I I really like all of this. Mm -hmm. Um, And then getting into a startup, you know, right after college, the the startup idea kind of came together during my final semester with myself and my co-founders. And um, we got a little little seed grant from NYU. And then that was all we needed to to lean into that. Did you, how did your parents react to it? Like, were they like, dude, get a real job? Or yeah, they, my, yeah, my parents were like, why aren't you doing on-campus recruiting? <laughs> and um, <laughs> That was the specific career path they thought. Yeah, yeah, be, yeah. Like, my, you'll my, be, my you would be great like, at this. <laughs> you, I remember, you remember the doctor thing? <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> my mom was like, don't you want to go work at IBM and climb the corporate ladder? And I was like, no, absolutely, absolutely yeah, not. I, I did the hedge fund that. thing. I don't... Yeah, and it's like, I, I think it's still taken them a long time to see to to even get it and like uh-huh. get what i'm doing and kind of how my career <laughs> path like, so when my, my, my mom still has like so many questions about it um but but it's just like a different mentality right yeah. it was a mentality of hey you can go work at a company and if you work hard you can build a career there for 30 years and i yeah. just think that idea is like really few and far between it's like a it yeah. seemed more common in a certain time period maybe yeah it doesn't seem as common now it doesn't seem as common now and and i think even when you look at secure jobs or yeah. great pl- great places to go work go work at facebook or netflix you can give them your life and soul for five years but then yeah. they might have a down quarter and it's like nope we're laying off 20 percent of you guys i think it's got to be common outside that like outside the tech world outside the even e-commerce and stuff like that i the people I know work at the same place 20 years. It's like they're, you know, they're like HVAC specialists. Yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah. yeah. Plumbers or something yeah. like that. Which is now hot, you know? So yeah, no, that's like the hot thing to do now. <laughs> yeah. Is like, yeah. Like, do trade. Uh, okay. I want to, I want to double click on one thing really quick yeah. because like nobody has ever been able to explain this to me in a way I can understand. Maybe I'm just a simple dude here. What is a hedge fund? 
Like, can you explain it to me like I'm, I won't say six. Cause, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because every time somebody says explain it to me like I'm six, yeah. the thing that comes next is like, you must know some smart six-year-olds because that made no sense. Like, explain it to me like I'm 12. Yeah. You know how people trade in the stock market? Yeah. Individuals, like you'll pick certain yeah, stocks. Yeah, like and, I could, I could buy so some Apple stock yeah, and yeah, wait yeah. for it to go up and then sell it. Exactly. Uh-huh. They like to add a layer of intellectual complexity on top, on top of that okay. to make it seem like they're doing really smart things from a trading standpoint. I so, so they'll say, we are far better traders than you. you will ever be individually mm-hmm. because we have all of these very interesting strategies and beliefs on how the market will uh-huh. operate. So they tend to find more like some of these hedge funds tend to find hyper quantitative people. Like they really hire like math and physics people because mm-hmm. they're like, we want to do all of this, you know, data yeah. analysis and like yeah, train certain yeah, yeah. algorithms right. and trade off of those algorithms. So it can get pretty technical. Some hedge funds like get really technical around the numbers. Uh-huh. Others get technical around certain viewpoints of the world or companies. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's a basically kind of, they claim to have an edge on trading. Exactly. So they say you give us your money. Yeah. We'll trade it more effectively than you could. Yeah. Are they and right? we'll take a 2% are, management fee and 20% in profit. Are they correct? Like, is that true? Like, for the most part? Or? Um, for the most part, there have been, like, Every, like, great... rich person you ever heard, hear of, you're, like, somebody's, like, they're a hedge fund guy. I'm, like, that means something. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, where, where I think they make all of their money is off of fees, right? Because, <laughs> okay. like, you, you, would take two you, you have a $10 billion hedge fund. You get 2% fees off of that. So you make $200 uh, million dollars in so fees really a year. So it's really about raising money. So it's about, like, raising. It's, like, how much capital do you have right and some of these hedge funds have like 80 billion dollars 100 billion dollars but you need a pre- you can run that with a pretty skeleton crew uh-huh. so everyone has like a five million dollar base salary plus like upside okay and like sure even if you do 10 percent, right even if you match like the nasdaq you're still making a ton of money off of that right getting 20 percent off of profit like you could just trade the smp and like make some bank honestly yeah <laughs> and then it's like you go look at vanguard and so it's you like, don't necessarily have to be better at trading than other people you just have to be able to like be good enough to convince people you're better at trading yeah listen if you look at the maybe like the top 10 hedge funds like there's just one hedge fund renaissance technologies like yeah. for 35 years they've had a positive year every single year okay. at like so there are some years. that there are, there are legit, some that yeah. really crush it um but it's also been now like 10 years since I've looked at any of those. Right, yeah. Okay. Uh, any of those numbers. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. Dude, I learned something today. No, yeah. I know what a hedge fund is now. It's basically just like a... Working, a, it's working basically there, just I have a no sales idea. job. Yes. It sounds like. <laughs> yes, yeah. exactly. Startup, you started basically a social media app. What year was this? 2013. So this is... What were the, what were the growing social media apps at this time? Snapchat. Like Snapchat. Yeah. yeah. What was yours? Explain your social media app. So it was a, it was actually a Chrome extension that allowed you okay. to share links and have conversations directly on web pages. So okay. if you remember Google Chat, like G Chat, yeah, I remember. Yeah, that. it was like a G Chat that followed you everywhere when you browsed, where you could just like you're reading a New York Times article, uh-huh. you could just mention a friend on the page, a chat bot pops open, and then you guys have a one-on-one conversation. And it'd be there. like connected to their like Google Plus account or something like that? Not even connected to their Google Plus account. It was it was kind of like built into the browser itself. So you'd I have see. this inbox that like pops open from the browser, uh-huh. and then it's a place where all of your links and conversations are organized, and it's the conversation kind of lives on the page. Got you. Uh, okay, so what happened there? Did you guys like find some product market fit with it? Did you make money? Yeah. How do you, I mean, and also how did you live? You were working off of a grant, like where did, yeah, yeah, how yeah. did you eat food and stuff like yeah, that? Yeah. So, Cause so I we, imagine you still needed to like subsist. Yeah. So, so we, so we got that grant. We actually returned that grant because it came with some conditions of like uh-huh. operating under their accelerated program. So we're like, all right, we're not doing this. Yeah. Um, myself and my co-founders actually knew each other from high school and two okay. of us went to NYU, the third one went to Carnegie Mellon. And so, we got this grant. We were living in New York for three weeks, and then we're like, "We're leaving this program. We're just gonna go back home and just live with our parents okay. for the next whatever six and I'm sure months." Your parents as, were as we built this. this. They, they were they were super thrilled about <laughs> yeah. this. They're like, you didn't it, hear about it at all. What, they're like, what is going on? <laughs> um, I think they were all very alarmed when we came back home. But then, when every day at eight o'clock in the morning, we just go to our one friend's house and then we'd be there uh-huh. till 10 o'clock at night. His parents were like the most cool. Then. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And they were just like, you can have the basement. We're not around here. You can, you can work. Uh-huh. And so they saw us working every single day for like okay. 15 hours a day. And they're like, okay, they, they're like, you doing, something. Try, they're, doing something. They're doing yeah. something. Um, so we did that for about seven months and got kind of our initial traction just through friends and kind of like launching, like sending it out to, to, to our network. And um, one of our 
One of my professors who I was close with was a managing director at a VC fund called First Mark in New York City. Okay. And I sent him the product. He started using it with his fund and he was like, this is super cool. I'm interested in this. So he put together a round. So we raised from like three or four different uh, VC funds mm -hmm. um, because the nature of a social consumer app is yeah. that you have to raise funding for it because you do not make money until you scale the business. Until you, you have to have a lot of users before you You have it. to have a lot of users or you charge your users. But if yeah. you charge your users, you're kind of doing a enterprise play. Yeah. Um, like, so, a link, like a LinkedIn. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or you're like, yeah, just selling directly to, you know, small, medium-sized businesses. Yeah, so like a lot, of, in, a lot of people listen to my show, they're like bootstrap. Yeah. You know, sometimes e-commerce people, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, it's a very simple, fun product sell it for more than you bought it for. Yep. Uh, or, you know, agency people, they spin up a service like you've got now or a, um, even a course or something like that. Or sometimes they're just like at the beginning of their journey. So I think what would be interesting is break down like raising money because I think a lot of people say like, oh, we raised a small round from VCs or we raised like a friends and family round. And I'm a, a lot of people have just like never, I've been in entrepreneurship for a while. I've never gone about raising money. I would not even know how to start. Yeah. Yeah. So... I think in in the world of software, it is much more common to go out and yeah. kind of raise around. And especially in this era of 2013 to 2016, 2010 to 2016, um, there was a lot more appetite there was a lot for, of for money out there. There was a lot more money for consumer software because Twitter took off IPO, Facebook took off IPO, Snapchat was gaining a million yeah. users a month, like at a hundred million dollars. Instagram, got bought, in that Instagram got bought, Pinterest was super hot. So there was like, hey, there's this thing, you know, Yelp, all, all, all of these platforms, yeah. Foursquare, so on. So there was a lot of appetite and interest. And I had a bunch of friends working on various products in this space. Um, so actually going about and raising money. You know, if you go raise, you know, if you go raise from venture capital firms, they'll which say, is what you did. which is what I did. They will say, hey, where we come in at the earliest stage or the seed stage, uh -huh. but we still need to see some traction of product. We need to see if you don't have a background of like, I'm a, yeah, I was a head of growth at Twitter. Um, you're just a 21 year old college kid. They're like, I need to see a product. I need to see people using the product and I need to see the numbers on what does their retention look like using the product. Interesting that they call it a seed stage because isn't basically by definition a seed stage is supposed to be like this is zero or like ground zero. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in theory, yes. Right. A seed, like a seed, right? Correct. You put Cor a seed in the ground before anything. Correct. Comes, right. Correct. Uh, but they, they're like, we need to... Like, I get it though, because it's like, you can't just pitch us an idea. Like you got to show me something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I totally understand it, right? And I, think I understand product, but users seems... That yeah. Seems, yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it, I think there's a, there's a kind of variety of factors because in the same breath, you know, there were some companies back then that raised 25 million bucks off of an idea. And sometimes it just matters like yeah. who are your connections and like how you much can do they really trust communicate you the and, idea or if you're connected, you know, can, can you really like pitch a certain vision? And I think what, what is most important or, or what a really big takeaway for me from the fundraising process is, is when you are pitching to investors, you are exclusively in the headspace and in the like language of talking about a vision and a future that does not exist yeah. and comping that to some really big players. Yeah. So we were kind of saying like, hey, all of like photo sharing and link sharing was happening on Facebook. Instagram took photo sharing. Mm -hmm. No one's taken link sharing. Like yeah. that's the play that we're going after. Investors love that. Right. You know, so everyone's you like, Dude, that's like, a, an insane North star. Yeah. But you know, that like you sell them the vision, but then when you're selling to uh, like, I'm just trying to convince you to get on the app. I'm like, dude, it's a faster way to send links. Yeah. You know, and you're like, okay, but why do I need that? And then it's like, we, we get into the nuanced mechanics of how it works. Right. So the sale, like the sales pitch to a consumer is very different than the sales pitch to yeah, an it's investor. It's going to be just like a simple, here's how this makes your life better. Exactly. To a always, consumer. Always. To an investor, you got to like make it out to be like this big, yeah, it's be this big thing. Th this really big thing. And there's a lot of diligence done and there's a lot of rounds of pitching that you have to do. And there's a lot yeah. of materials that you have to get together. And it can be a pretty time does it, intensive does a lot process. Of come, does a lot of it come down? to like i mean could you even get into doing that if you like weren't connected at all like you just like reach out to vc films and be like yo can i come pitch, pitch you or they they say you can but no i don't think so yeah, i and, think and you would have no idea how to put that pitch together yeah yeah so like you need to know somebody like you had a 
sort of a mentor who like was there and could be like, Hey, this is what you need to put into your deck, your pitch deck. Correct. And stuff. And like, yeah. kind of guide you. Yeah, absolutely. And could get you in the room to pitch. Correct. Correct. Yeah. So like just your average Joe dude couldn't be like, yo, I got an idea. Yeah. 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 A hundred percent. But I also think it's, um, raising venture money and even taking outside capital is, is not right for so many businesses. For, for most small, medium businesses in the, in the, in the country. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's, there, there's what you have to figure out is how far can I get on my own yeah. with my own skills? If, and if it's, I need money to go to even start getting traction on this idea, then it's like, maybe you shouldn't really go down that route. Yeah. All right. So you're building a social app. So it's it's going to be the, going to be the Facebook of, it's going to take link sharing from Facebook. Yeah. Yeah. That yeah. That was the vision. Yeah. Exactly. Easier way to share links. Exactly. Uh, you morphed it because you didn't like make a hard decision for it to become an agency. Right. So you kind of like morphed it into yeah. an agency. Like so, walk me through that. Who was the first person who was like, Hey, I'll pay you money to do stuff for me. So basically here's what happened. We grew that product to about 50 to 60,000 users. We had a what? really loyal fan base wow. of the product and we had a great usage. What was it called? Like I have point. I've never heard of it. Yeah. You had 60,000 users. I've never yeah. heard of it. Yeah. 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 That's like my era too. Yeah. 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 And it was like the, at that point, Product Hunt, I don't know if you were in yeah, that, no, that space. Yeah. Product Hunt was super hot. We were like the top product on Product Hunt of all time. Wow. We had like a huge I mean, launch I feel there. bad for not knowing this. No, 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 no. It's <laughs> fine. It's uh, yeah. you know, ten, 12 years ago. Right. Um, there, was a, there was a ton of resonance with the product. And we got to a point where it's like, okay, you're three years, two and a half years in. You have 60,000 um, 60, users on the product, mm -hmm. but Snapchat's adding a million users a month. Yeah. So every investor is like, well, if we want to invest in this business, you need to show me that kind of customer acquisition, that kind of user acquisition. Right. And so all of our investors were like, we don't we can't turn this into a series a if you're going after this consumer playbook but mm -hmm. if you turn this into an enterprise app and start selling to enterprises where we think there's a lot of value in it then yeah we'll give you like five so you million can get bucks by with this. sixty thousand or like a smaller user base or oh yeah because you you basically ad business can work better or you can just charge the enterprises you sell into the, the company and directly. then you sell them per seat right per yeah. per employee that uses like, it basically that's like the slack model slack model dropbox slack box yeah. so on yeah um, so all of our investors were like, why don't you guys pivot to an enterprise company? At this point, we were 23 years old and neither myself nor my co-founders wanted to go build an enterprise You're company. Like, we're 23 years old. And we want to do something cool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We're like, dude, that's not cool. Like Snapchat, not cool. Snapchat is that cool. It's not sexy, dude. You, you know, and I think it's, it's super important to know kind of who you are and like what you know and what you don't know. And I'm like, yeah. are we going to just like grind it out trying to sell an enterprise tool that like we can't actually sell because we don't know anything about how enterprise communications work. Yeah. So we're just like, okay, let's keep the product alive because cost wise, it doesn't really cost much to keep the product Still. alive. Our investors are like, that's totally fine. Like part ways you can go do, do your next thing. And when you want to start another business, we're here for you. Cause yeah. that's like the nature of their thing, right? Yeah. They're, like they're not pissed that it didn't No, they, out, they yeah. take 99 they take a hundred bets. Ninety nine don't work. One, One is going to be huge. Shopify. Yeah, you know. Okay. Got it. Um, so after that, we kind of were we explored a kind of sale. We like talked to a couple companies. Talked to Dropbox. We talked to Medium back then. That was like a super interesting process. We ended up joining a company that was um, another consumer social company that was founded by one of the guys who started Venmo. He was doing a kind of like predecessor to Clubhouse. Um, if you okay. remember the. Yeah, the yeah. one that was hot for like that was a hot. month. Yeah, 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 exactly, yeah. exactly. So, so it was, it was the audio only. Like if, it was if audio you only. If you weren't around in that one month. Yeah, 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 you would have no uh, idea. Yeah, for the listeners. Uh, it was like an audio only, like, I don't, it's like Twitter spaces, I guess. Audio like. only Twitter, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like it just it was people talking. Yeah. It's like what you're listening to right now, but like you could try and get yes. up on stage if you wanted and. There was some wild conversations happening there. Very wild conversations. Yeah. Um, so it was a kind of predecessor to that concept. We joined there for about a little under a year. And then that company had its own kind of challenges, kind of building and growing a yeah. social consumer product, as there's many challenges with that. And so after this, we said, hey, we've gotten good at design and product and engineering. Yeah. We want to continue building stuff. 
but we don't know what we want to build next. Let's like just start contracting. Let's start like freelancing. Yeah. And the first gig that we ended up and getting. This is still all three of you? Like, this is still all three yeah. of us. And the first gig we, start, we ended up getting was with a new digital bank um, uh -huh. that was servicing small businesses. And that ended up being a year and a half long project, which was yeah. designing all of their interfaces and building the front end and integrating it with the back end. They're, yeah, d designing like basically their app user experience. All of it, all of it. And so that was a pretty uh -huh. intensive project, um, which was a super great way to, to start yeah. the, the agency. So they like offered you money to do that and you basically kind of forgot about your own product for like a year and a half because they're their work took precedent yeah 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 and it was and then it just snowballed from there other people want to pay you to do it exactly yeah exactly if you go back in time 23 year old ashwin and somebody's giving you the advice to take your product and make it a b2b product an enterprise product you wanted it to be this kind of social app or social media thing yeah and uh they're saying like no you need to sell it make that slack pivot mm -hmm. and sell it to or Dropbox pivot, sell it to businesses. If you go back and tell them to do it, would you tell them to do it? Yeah. I think what you think that would have been a huge opportunity in, in enterprise. I think there was, you know, Slack was just getting started back yeah. then. And I think there was probably an easy way to integrate with Slack. Yeah. Where you kind of ride the momentum off of Slack. And then maybe you just like get you know, acquired the by Slack or, 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 or something there. Um, I think the, the super important lesson out of that is distribution matters so much more than the execution of the idea. 100%. And the more that... Can you get people? Can you get people? And how efficiently can you get people? Getting yeah. an individual consumer one-on-one -on -one without like insane viral mechanics is yeah. really tough, which really is why hard. most consumer social apps fail to get that kind of escape velocity. Yeah. But when you sell to an enterprise and you understand their needs, it's like there's kind of playbooks if out there. they grow, you get people. Exactly. So one of the ways Slack, the main way Slack has grown is that they basically just entered like a bull market of employment. Mm -hmm. And these, these companies that got integrated, like these companies that use Slack added 2,000 people, right? Or 1,000 Shopify. I don't know if they use Slack, but they went from zero to however many people they have now and all those people are on Slack. And that just like grows Slack without Slack having to grow. They only have to sell once. Correct. Uh, yeah. I mean, that's an attractive idea. I guess at the time you maybe didn't have the ends and the connections to make it an enterprise product, but, or maybe you did. I don't know. Yeah. And I, or I also, you were just like, it's not sexy. Yeah. I, I also <laughs> think like if I were to tell 23 year old me that 23 year old me would probably be like, Dude, my investors are saying that. I'm still not going to do it, you know? Yeah, and yeah. I think everything is like... 23-year-old, <laughs> you wouldn't have listened anyway. <laughs> yeah, th th there's this idea that, that I think is like... it For me to... Like a lot of people can like seek advice and get advice. And I think some people can internalize that advice and not do that thing. But for me, yeah. it's always been like, I just have to learn the lesson on yeah. my own. Like I can kind of see it and observe it intellectually. Yeah. But I'm like, oh, I just got to do it, I Th think, on my own. You know, I hear the question asked often, like, oh, if you go your, give your younger self, self advice, what would you say? And I'm like, dude, not my younger John would not listen to shit, I have to say. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like, I wasn't listening to anybody. I thought I knew, you know? Mm -hmm. And I like, you're exactly right. Like, you had to go through the hardship. Yeah. To be like, oh, now I know what I would tell myself. But yeah. at the time, like, probably someone else was telling me that and I wasn't listening to him anyway. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. It's like you, you pick up the actual learning through that nuance of yeah. doing. Yeah. You would hope like you'd listen to your older self, but I don't think you would. No, I don't think so. Be like, dude, I don't believe you anyway. That's what well, you got a time machine or something. Yeah. 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 Uh, okay. So you pivot, you've got the digital bank. Now people are basically like, so this is word of what, how, how is this spreading at first? Cause it's 2017. You said you started doing the agency thing. How's it spreading at first? Is it like word of mouth? Yeah, it's it's word of mouth. It's just our connection. So we're reaching out to our investors and we say, hey, you guys know, we're doing this now. you know, the design and development work that we do. Yeah, we can build like really slick consumer facing interfaces. Yeah. And so they were plugging us into their portfolio companies and sending us out on email blasts and, and so on. Uh, okay. And so and so I very much thought the case was, hey, we're going to be a digital design and development agency building like consumer interfaces mostly apps you know right? most mostly apps you know whether it's like you know b2b or, b to b or yeah. you know banking b2c um and so that was probably our clientele for a couple of years and then our first 
kind of consumer physical product was one of my buddies from like the consumer software world and era, he was working on a startup of his own, came to us and he was like, hey, do you guys do like Shopify design and development? Do you do branding? Like he's, do you he's do launching an e-commerce design? store. Yeah, he's launching an e-commerce store. Like, and we're like, I want it to look good. We don't do any of that, but we'll figure it out. Yeah. You know, we're like That's generally good the, designers. The answer when you're an agency is yes. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yes, we do. Exactly. You guys, any of you guys ever worked with Shopify before? No. All right. We'll figure it out. Yep. Yeah. And so we figured it out. We launched that. Um, that grew really well pretty quickly. And uh -huh. he was kind of plugged into the space. So he sent a few people gotcha. our way. Does, can you say the brand? It's birth date. Oh, birth date candles? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Dope. Yeah. I mean, they're they're a great brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're a great brand. And like we've worked with them I mean, all throughout their growth. Really leader in the... this My, my D to C nerd is coming out here. I'm about to say a weird, a crazy statement. They're a leader in the direct-to-consumer candle space they're yes. like the brand they are yeah and direct to consumer candles yeah you go buy candles on the internet you're probably buying them for birthday candles yeah yeah um yeah they've done super well they've been great to work with launched a lot of fun products with them uh -huh. um so that was the first so they're brand. An ongoing client yeah they're an ongoing client um you do like do you do like their packaging design and like all the all of it no with um we it's a lot of tweaks and like updates to packaging mm. design and labeling design um as we launch new SKUs, like we'll work with certain illustrators but uh -huh. it's a lot more on the digital side um gotcha. so they're There's shopify their front side, end and like, like their back end yeah. yeah okay um so they were the first one and then that went well and he was close friends with um jambies that was like our yeah. second client Jambies, in the space also great brand um so yeah, we worked with them on their branding, site design, development. Yeah. Um, and then after that, yeah, there were just referrals, referrals, and that just kind of fed it. Dude, I, I mean, I were I I launched a performance marketing agency for e-commerce brands. Uh -huh. That's how I like kind of got made my first like bit and sold that and stuff like that. Sure. Like your first two clients were like like a bunch of e-commerce agencies, dream clients. You probably didn't even know at the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. Like you didn't even realize, but like those, those two clients are like on a lot of people's like dream list. You know, yeah. They're, they're you know awesome. Saying? Awesome brands and great people to work yeah. with. Too. Okay. So they're plugged in obviously. And, yeah. And people want to know what they're doing and they, so this is the thing that happens in e-commerce, especially, uh, visually they're like, it's such a knockoff space, right? Mm -hmm. So if you see a site you like, you're like, I want that. I want just my thing to look like that, but for mattresses or mm -hmm. my thing to look like that, but for wallets or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So like I could imagine you guys got basically just a bunch of referral work from there. Yeah. Okay. So my next question then is like, take me back like 18 months. You didn't really have an Instagram presence. You didn't really have a social media presence. Why? Well, like why decide to like make that post that mer that first post? So start posting content about this because you're clearly getting plenty of business, right? Yeah. So in... So, so I'll kind of caveat that too. There are, with the agency work, especially with the type of work that we do, there's very much ebbs and flows of that business. For sure. Um, and I also think the landscape of people launching consumer brands with big budgets for branding, digital it's design, getting development. Less and less. It's yeah. getting less and less. And not just like not the as market, much funding for exactly, physical products. Exactly. And anyway. so the, the market has changed and there's also the tools have become better and it's easier to like test ideas and concepts. And it's just like a natural evolution of the space where people are like, Oh, in 2015, I had to put $500,000 into getting something off the ground. Now it's like, I can skin and test uh, ideas and have it look pretty good for like five grand, 10 grand, yeah, 15 most grand. People are trying to bootstrap it at this point. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And so, um, so there was very much ebbs and flows, even though we had some great clients, um, in that, Hey, you don't know like when that next kind of big client is is right. Is, and even if you're working in. with Jambies or whatever, they might not have a project for you for six months. Or exactly, yeah. exactly. Um, so that's kind of like in the in the background, and that wasn't really a motivator for creating the content here. Um, how I got into this is so separate from the agency, um, we spun out a business called Oklahoma Smokes, and for that business, I spent a lot of time creating content on TikTok in like late 20, starting in late 2020. So okay. we're like one of the earlier brand, like we were early to being a brand on TikTok. Yeah, it was mostly just people dancing at that point. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And so we were doing really well on TikTok and I studied brands that were doing well on TikTok and I was creating all of the content for the brand. Mm -hmm. So I had reps of like, I probably made like 400 pieces of content on TikTok from a brand standpoint for Oklahoma Smokes at that point. So then 18 months ago, I'm like, well, I generally like, 
know how to create content on TikTok and create short form gotcha. content. Let me tr like I'm always talking about branding and marketing stuff with my clients or with my friends. Like, let me just put this on TikTok and see. It's kind of niche, but like, let me see if it finds an audience. Yeah. And somewhat quickly, it found an audience. On and then I was on like, TikTok on TikTok. And I was like, and this, I guess oh, I discovered is... you on Instagram, but you might be even bigger on TikTok. I'm guessing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so bigger on TikTok, and I started. I only started on Instagram 12 months ago. So there's about a six oh, month, wow, okay. six month difference yeah. there. Um, yeah. And then it started to find a uh, resonance and then I was getting a bunch of email and like, I didn't even have my email link. Like people were kind of going through the grapevine to find my email and reach yeah, out. And like like oh, hunting you down. Yeah. I was like, okay, there's something interesting here. And then I got into a cadence with it. And then from all of the work that we do on the agency side and the work that we do from like building Oklahoma smokes, I'm like, there's just a lot of fodder for content and ideas. Yeah. So it was relatively easy for me to make the content. People you just were finding had ideas it valuable. coming at you pretty yeah. regularly. And um, it started really working on TikTok and Instagram, but there was never any intention of I'm going to create this to drive leads for right. the business or leads for any business. Uh, so was it just like I'm going to create this for enjoyment or just to get it out in the world or... You know, when somebody asks me to explain something to them, I can just be like, just watch this video, dude. Like, so I don't have to explain the same thing 50 times over. Like, I'm just kind of wondering, yeah. like, or, or was it just like, I don't know, I got an idea today and I'm just going to make this video and I'm not really intending to like keep making content. Like how, do, yeah. If you called me, say we met now once, right? Yeah. And say you messaged me in a month and you said, hey, dude, I'm working on this business yeah. and I've started this. And I'm like struggling with this. I need help thinking about this. Do you have time for a call? Uh -huh. I will hop on a call with you and I will talk for as long as you want to talk about this. Okay. I would just do this. So I was doing this probably like every handful of weeks. My wife would always be like, who were you just on the phone with for two and a half hours? And I'm like, oh, that was like my buddy Jed. And she was like, who is Jed? I've never heard like of him. I was like, oh, he's like, Jet. This, he's that like, you sound like a real person. He's like this guy I knew from college. He's working on this Shopify app. And I was just, I was, yeah, I just like doing that. I just like right. doing that. It goes that, back right? to like, that was the stuff you were into watching as a kid. It's what I was into yeah. watching. It's what I'm into thinking about and doing. And yeah. so that's a kind of conversation that I can have. It's super, like your obsession. Kind it, of. Yeah. Yeah. It's just like, dude, I want to help you figure this thing out. So the way that I kind of look at my content is like, oh, I found that insight of like how this works from a branding standpoint or how this works from a distribution standpoint. I'm just going to put this out there because it's kind of like to whomever it helps, it's kind of like helping at scale. Yeah. Um, and so I just really like doing it. I, I really, yeah. truly like talking about the stuff that I talk about. How many videos did it take before you, like one? Or did you say like, I'm going to commit to it and be consistent or you just be like, when a video comes to me, I'll make it? No. And, and I... The, the no, there, there was, was one day where like just a ton of ideas came to me where there was like oh. I, I was like these are like the next 15 videos that I want to make I got it. um and it was probably the fifth or sixth one that maybe had like half a million views okay and I was like okay no nice. oh, then it's easier to keep going then you. it's easier yeah. to keep going it's like so much dope yeah, yeah you yeah. know <laughs> that's um, 500,000 little hits of dope a hundred percent a hundred percent uh so then that was like when you decided to be like consistent with well i guess that's another question is like do you have like a cadence where you're like i'm gonna be consistent with this with like making videos or is it like if i've got something good to say i'll say it if not because i think everyone says it's like be consistent but i think that is sort of like counterintuitive to like the creative process sometimes yeah i don't think you need to be consistent and i mean i was i was just talking to a buddy who's also creates content in a very similar space yeah. um about this and both him and i post basically Monday through Friday. Yeah. We were like 80% of weeks, we post five pieces of content a week. Um, but this one creator who, who we like and who's who's huge and makes super interesting stuff, he's like once every week or once every two weeks, mm -hmm. like just here and there. And you get the sense when you watch this video, he's like, oh, he's just been thinking about this for the last day and has like put, yeah. put this out there. And so I don't think it's so much about I think what people are really saying when they're saying, oh, you need to be consistent is you need to put out enough stuff to know what's going to work for you or your brand yeah. in terms of like content style and hooks. But if you're just consistent in one format that doesn't work, that that's not like a good direction to yeah. put, push people in. It's like, well, now you've created 90 pieces of content. You haven't learned anything because you were right. just consistent about doing the same doing silly this. thing every day. 
Yeah, I hear you. And dude, I think it's, I, I, as someone who like, I, I would love my content to like get more teeth, right? And uh, I think a lot of people would as well. You're creating content that I think, you know, it, it, I mean, for I guess anyone who's listening hasn't seen your content, you basically create like break, green screen videos, breakdowns of like rebrands or the branding on, on certain products. Is that an accurate way to describe it, do you think? Generally, yeah. Yeah. I think there's a lot of people who would like love to get the traction you're getting and they're like, dude, I don't know. I feel like I'm trying super like, and then like, there's some people like, I feel like when I talk to you or some other people who have gotten, it doesn't seem that hard. You know what I mean? Yeah. And this is a tough one. I mean, he, what I can say is like, it, when, when you have to engineer, when you have to engineer it or, or kind of look at, I think what people, some people do is like, they'll see a certain format or a person that has like done really well with their content right and they'll be like i'm gonna make that content and yeah. try to make it work for me too but there's just something about that that like tends to not be the way that it works right yeah. and it's like i started doing the green screen and it's like i don't know if i'd even seen a green screen video before mm -hmm. i was just like this is the most natural format for me to like point at something that i'm that i'm talking about yeah um it's i always say like if it's an idea or a concept that like is in your head and you just feel like you have to get it out there. And if you can just film it as if you're talking to one person mm. and you're excited to share that thing with that one person, if you can do that and do that earnestly, then like that's 95% of the video being successful. Okay. And it's not so much the editing and like the flourish and the lighting and the sound, like all yeah. of those things. It's like, they have to hit a certain threshold, right? You yeah. don't want to be in a completely dark room and like shitty right. audio and, and right. stuff. Um, but it's the, the, a lot of things that people tend to focus on in terms of like the brass tactics of like filming and editing yeah. matter less. And it's more so like, dude, you're excited about the thing that you're going to talk about yeah. and like make a video on here. Is that like if, and the, my next question was going to be this and it seems like maybe you just answered it is like, Somebody comes to you, they've got like no followers and they're like, look, I want to make content. I want to grow on TikTok or I want to grow on Instagram. Like, give me the step by step because like, I don't really know what I'm doing at all. Is that basically what you'd say to them? Like, first of all, you just got to be like, what's something you want to talk about? Yeah, I'd be, I was talking to a buddy of mine who's a really great wildlife and like natural landscape photographer uh -huh. and he's been like posting a ton of like static content on Instagram for the past 10 years. And he was like, I'm trying to sell some of my prints. Like, how do you think I should think about TikTok and Instagram? Mm -hmm. And I was like, dude, with you, like the, the prints are great. You know, I look at this picture of the Grand Canyon or the picture of these like mountains in Thailand that you, that you took a picture of. But to me, that's like, that's just a picture. And I probably seen that picture on the internet somewhere else. So that's not right. that captivating. But what's really captivating is like, you flew from Colorado to Thailand and like took these seven train rides and did all of this. Like, t the, just show me that background. Like, show me that story. Because when I sit with him one-on-one, -on -one, he's like super interested and eager to share that story. So mm. it's almost like how I would tell him to think about making, how I tell him to think about making content is like, okay, here is like, that like I took this picture, but yeah. like here's the six days leading up to it. That was crazy. And it's like I first landed in Chiang Mai and like here was the super wild experience that I had. Like yeah. a monkey took my food. And it's like whatever, just like tell the story, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So okay, let me give you like one piece of pushback here. Sure. Because right? I feel like uh like a lot of the conversations I have on a day-to-day -day basis, I do basically I just sit on like five to ten Zoom calls with e-com brands a day and try mm -hmm. and help them solve marketing problems. Mm -hmm. That's very niche and very nerdy. Yeah. And the advice you always get in content creation is like, you got to like take the idea and make it broader. And I feel like that's maybe where I should, like a lot of people who, a lot of people are very passionate about talking about something that's like super niche down, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But like to actually get views, you found a way to like take that niche down thing and maybe make it broader. So yeah. a lot of people are interested in it. So, okay, here, I'll give you a perfect example uh -huh. of, of how to do that. So I'll give you two examples actually. There is one account, um, they sell, it's called like Bessie Nails or something. It's like an e-com brand. They sell like stick-on nails or something. Okay. When they make content about like their nails or like different colors or how to apply them, taps out at like a couple thousand views max. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, very product-focused. Yeah, yeah, very, very product-focused stuff. 
And there's like time and place for that, but you can't do that with every piece of content. Yeah. But then she'll make, she'll throw in some content of like, here is like, here is how Sophia Richie has captivating nails. And it's like, you've taken, that's broadened the aperture so much yeah. because you've tapped into this, to this audience of people who care about Sophia Richie. Okay. okay. That's interesting hook. We're now dialing into like the category of nails, which is like the category in which you're playing in and selling product in. And you were now speaking about that as an expert. Right. Yeah. And at no point are you selling me product, but I watched that. I was like, Oh, that's like super interesting. Yeah. As a content creator, I'm going to follow you. And okay, I see a couple more of those, and then I go see the profile, and yeah. it's like, oh, okay, they they sell. Right, and now you're talking. I mean, you're not going to buy nails, but you're talking about them. Your wife might know about them. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Another great example of this that I saw is um, there's this content creator who who does a lot of stuff on marketing, and his his thing is like he talks about the downfall of like certain creators. He's like, this is like this is why like Buzzfeed. It's like the, it's yeah, like I mean, the the, the, yeah. the downfall of like Kourtney Kardashian. He'll like break it down and stuff. Okay. Um. So it obviously is like very polarizing, but it gets a ton of views. He had a really interesting video recently where he was like, um, I'm going to do the downfall of Lemmy, which is Kourtney Kardashian's like gummy brand. Okay. And he's talking about it. It went super viral and he's talking about it and he's like, I wanted to love this. I love everything about their packaging, blah, blah, blah. He like really kind of gasses them up. And then he was like, but then I like look at all of the ingredients and like, this is BS for like these reasons, blah, 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 blah. He also has a like honey supplements brand uh -huh. and he kind of ties back he was like this is overdose with melatonin and like this is actually what you want to be looking for and he like makes it relevant to his yeah. product so he starts by going broad saying i'm going to talk about like I mean, courtney kardashian but and both Lemmy. examples you just gave you celebrities basically yeah 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 exactly it's like a quick hack i guess that, that's a quick <laughs> hack i think listen i think if you talk about something immediately relatable that yeah. people can recognize for and i'll talk about this with my own content like sometimes the other day I did a, a video about like Lamborghini's rebrand and even before posting it, I just know that's going to do well a lot because of like know about dude, a lot of people know about Lamborghini. Boot. Everyone's going to have opinions on their views. One of your biggest videos is the freaking Vita Coco video that like, no, do people know about? Not a lot of people. I guess it's a lot of people do kind of know about yeah. it, but not like Lamborghini. Yeah. 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 You know what I mean, yeah. so I think I, sometimes stuff hits. I bet you didn't expect that one to hit. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So sometimes stuff hits, but I mean, that's good. Right. So it's like, broaden it by tying it to something everybody knows so take your expertise and then like tie it to something everybody knows either a current event people are talking about or like a celebrity 100 okay, percent. Cool. so we'll just say like taylor swift she's going on the thumbnail of this episode there you go yeah we that's said it. taylor swift that's it yeah we're talking about her that's it uh all right man i'm gonna let's hit some rapid fire we're gonna do some this is I, I told somebody, somebody asked me about this. He's like, oh, this is, that was cool. You did this rapid fire. I'm like, this is specifically so we could create short form content. So I'm just telling fourth wall. Love it. Let's do We're it. Making short form content Great. right now. All right. You are hired to do a rebrand. I'm going to okay. hit you with hard ones that sure. have good brands. Okay. You're hired to do a rebrand for Apple. Wow. They are committed to a rebrand. They're committed to like, not just tweaks. All right. Yeah. You can't just tweak it. You got to rebrand Apple. What are you doing? Wow. Uh, well, we're going to rebrand them to BlackBerry. <laughs> <laughs> Make it all black. It was all white. It's all black now. Yeah. So, you know, obviously name, logo, that, that, that so when we talk about rebrands, right, people tend to think it's like just the logo mark and whatever, but it's like right. overarching kind of like vi vision. When people say, what is brand? Yeah. How do you, how do you define it? I have a way that I do it, but how do you do it? Yeah. Every form of communication that comes out of a company. Interesting. I say it's like. It's what it's how it's the when somebody says your brand's name, who's the person somebody thinks of? Yeah. Right. Like yeah. when I say like Hollister. Yeah. A person came to your mind. Totally. You know what I'm saying? Uh -huh. When I said like when I say like affliction, like a freaking 2000s douche came to your mind. Uh -huh. Right. Uh, so like that, that's how I define brand, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Yours is bit better and more official, but it, it's, it leads to the same thing, right? Because yeah. when you think of a person, it's like, okay, what personality do they embody? Yeah. And then across every form of communication that a brand has, what is the personality that's yeah, embodied? Exactly. So it's like, you get to the same place. All right, so that. Apple, you're yeah. rebranding Apple. So Apple, Apple is in a, in a place where I think they have just, um, they're kind of like stagnating on innovation a, a little Ooh. bit. I like that you you're know? going hot with it. Yeah, you're coming yeah, in yeah. hot with your I, pitch. We've got iPhone 15. What have they done here? They've just made it uh, more difficult <laughs> to charge. They put a 15 on it. They, they put a know? 15 on it. They've run titanium ads, which have fallen flat, even to the biggest like Apple fanboys, right? Yeah. They have the Apple Vision Pro, which was admittedly 
very hype. There was yeah. a lot of hype around it. There was also a lot of returns and people are <laughs> like, I don't know that I can just like put this thing on my head all day. My neck hurts, etc." Yeah. Um, I think there is a, we're at this peak of kind of like phone saturation. And as a society, we are tethered to our devices. We're tethered to all of our applications and Apple's giving us some stuff like screen time. Here's how to like toggle down and, and, and toggle away. But I think the first tech company that can really lean into this and say, hey, your phone is great at some things, but we want to make sure that you can create mm. a distance between like your real life and you're still the living. The anti-device device. The anti-device device, but still within the realm of their device and just kind of like get ahead of the shift uh -huh. of people leaving this and going to a light phone. So that's the message. What does it look like? visually the, like i don't know that yet man this is, a, this is a great question and it should should be paid very handsomely to yeah, do that yeah no I, okay all right all right so that's the message i like it all right next one we'll do one more of these and then we're going to do some celeb collab netflix hires you to rebrand yeah what are you doing so netflix we're doing number one we got to reevaluate this name right we're talking <laughs> net we're talking like early 2000s lingo yeah. of the internet order your dvds right put, put them in your queue yeah put, put put them in your queue and it's flicks yeah flicks. you know yeah do people like does a 22 year old know what a flicks yeah it flicks is right so so the name i think has like lost lost a lot of the meaning there so well, would you rename it let, let's let's okay. put let's, let's put let's put this put on a little pin so, yeah let's put a pin in that um they are they have so much content that people are paralyzed by an overwhelming amount of choice from Netflix. I think it's a universal problem that like you just scroll endlessly. 45 yeah. minutes later, you haven't decided what to watch. Dude, even the producer's nodding his head over here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Not, everybody so, knows. Yeah. So I think like all things, like all technology, there's pendulum swings, right? Uh -huh. We had linear TV and cable where you tune in to a certain channel. Everyone's watching the thing at the and same it's time. Back. Show me what's next. Exactly. And I think... That it offloads the choice, right, from the consumer being like, I want to watch this versus versus this. I want to be able to turn on Netflix and just have some linear programming. Like mm. put all of your food shows into this channel that uh, I can just tune in on. And I know anyone watching that Netflix channel, hey, we're all watching, yeah. it, you know, Anthony I, Bourdain at that moment. Right, right. And you can still choose. Like there's still You can still can choose, choose, but there's this kind of parallel but based experience. based on the algorithm that it knows you like, it's feeding you some linear program. Yeah. I like this. Yeah. I like, so it's a, it's a UI. It's a, it's a user interface. It's a big redesign. UI, UI shift. Yeah. We don't need that. more content. There's also something interesting about how like as some wild percentage of people who watch content on all of these streaming platforms are just watching reruns of like old shows of like yeah. friends, Seinfeld TV. And it's I like, dead. Yeah. We don't Netflix need more just gets rid net of new those. content. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Do you know what I like about that too? is that it actually leverages Netflix's moat in the streaming space, which is algorithmic data mm -hmm. on people's viewing patterns. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of streaming services now, but Netflix has spent a ton of time like getting people's preferences down. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like testing their thumbnails and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So it like go leans into that moat, allows them to like deliver programming that people like. I yeah. Like I like it. All right. Two celebrity collabs. Okay. All right. So here's, here's the premise. Sure. You're going to give me a celebrity collab. Money is no object. You got to come up with a celebrity and like first idea for the campaign. First idea pitch for the campaign. The brand is Doritos. Doritos. Um, Carrot Top. <laughs> okay. Yeah. You're just going straight visual with it. We're just going straight visual. He looks visual. like a Dorito? He looks like a Dorito. And that's it. And I think it's just the visual reinforcement of it. There. Taps into like the nostalgia of like our generation that's, that's like true. eating Doritos. He's like in so many commercials back in the day. Mm -hmm. And I think we have we have all of the new celebs, like the new faces, you know, uh -huh. that are getting all of the airtime. Kardashians of 78 brands. Right. Now let's bring back Carrot Top. Bring back Carrot Top. Yeah. Just put him next to a Dorito and be like, this and it'll guy, just be hilarious. This guy's a perfect, perfect Dorito spokesperson. We don't even need to say anything. <laughs> exactly. Else. It's just him eating Doritos. <laughs> that's it. That's the that's, that's the it. Ad. That's the campaign. That's the ad. All right. Next one. Celeb collab. Say the celeb and the premise for the campaign for. I'll let you. I'll let you pick again. It's going to be a drink brand. It's going to be Red Bull or Coca Cola. Okay, we will do Red Bull. All right. Give me the celebrity collab for Red Bull. Red Bull and Tom Cruise. <laughs> And it is going to be just epic. It is going to be epic. 
it is going to be him doing all of his Mission Impossible scenes. Yeah. Just kind of kitted out in yeah. Red Bull stuff, a ton of behind the scenes stuff, which is already super, super interesting to watch. Yeah. I did say money was no objects, but I don't think Tom Cruise does them. He's never been in a commercial. He's the only person you we've only seen on the big screen. Yeah, that's right. That's right. You want to change your answer? You're like, no, we're going to get him. No, we'll, we'll, we'll get him. We'll, we'll donate him. enough to the Church of Scientology. There you go. And we'll get him. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Oh, that's the tactic. That's, a, yeah. that's, the that's campaign. how you get him. That's the infiltration. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right, Ash, plug your stuff. Where do people follow you? It's like Schwinnebago. Schwinnebago. Yeah. yeah. Th- two ends. Schwinnebago everywhere. That's right. Uh, if you are like, hey, man, this guy knows what he's doing and you're an e-com brand or you're any kind of... If you're Red Bull. If you're Red Bull. You <laughs> and you want to pull Tom it Cruise. off with Tom Cruise and money's no object, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, find him. For, uh, what's the website for your agency? Forge. Forge.coop. 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 That's right. Uh, it's been, blunt, been a pleasure, man. Thanks for, been great. Thank thanks you. for coming by.